Welcome to Built with IPFS, where we explore the IPFS ecosystem by looking at some of the apps and tools that are being built with IPFS, both from a user and a technical perspective. I'm Daniel, developer advocate for IPFS, and today we're going to look at Minter Hypermedia. And for that, I have Alex and Eric from the Minter team who will be joining for this. And we're going to work through a technical introduction uh, to get a little bit of an understanding of how Minter works and also see it in action. Um, so before we get in, uh, I want to give a warm welcome to Alex and Eric. Also, thank you to uh, the viewers who are watching this. Um, so welcome, Alex, and welcome, Eric. Great to have you. Thanks for having us. Hi, everyone. So Thanks for having before we get into Minter, I'd love to, uh, if, uh, I'd love it if you could just give a, a brief background and uh, you could introduce yourselves and how you came to work on Minter. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, well. Go ahead, Alex. Eric, you can start. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Eric Vicente. Uh, I come from a sort of self-taught uh, front-end development background. I've worked at a big company. I've worked at Facebook, and I've also worked at a bunch of startups. And uh, how I came to work at Minter is, uh, well, I was sort of on my own journey, but uh, I've always been super passionate about open source. And uh, when I discovered the Minter team, I got really excited because there's a group of people who are doing something really big for the world. And well, I'm also a self-taught uh, software engineer. I've uh, been working um, for the most part on the back end and lower level kind of things. I've uh, been doing car sharing, was working at a car sharing company before. And then uh, we founded Minter with my co-founder, Gabo, who's not here yet today with us. But um, yeah, we've been doing that for about four years already. And it's been a it's been a journey, and we actually had a chance to meet at IPFS camp a year ago. It was just Alex. Yeah. I think Eric, had you joined at that point, or did you join no. after no. IPFS camp? Yeah, yeah, I've only so been with was... the company for about a year. Okay, um, and so it seems like you've come a long way. I remember you, uh, both Gabo and you, Alex, uh, along with your other co-founder yeah. Horacio, you presented yeah. a bit of. Uh, how you use CRDTs. And, and so today I think we're gonna get a look both of, at Minter, Hypermedia, and, and see how some of that work has evolved. Um, and yeah, yeah some maybe a good quite a bit, by the way. <laughs> so, Great, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna bother burden the, the viewers uh, with some of the changes, but I think we can just get a clean slate on this. And, and with that, I yeah, think sure. maybe a good place to start would be how would you most concisely describe Minter? And uh, do you want to do already start with a demo, uh, a description, or should we just start with like, how do you want to do this? Yeah, we could, we could do a, a very quick demo and then we'll go into more depth as we sort of walk through the technical details. But yeah, how, how I would describe Minter is uh, I would say it's, a, it's an open publishing system, uh, which allows sort of intellectual communities who want to build knowledge together. It allows them to collaborate on like really uh, rich and deeply linked content. So uh, here's the Minter application uh, as it is today. Uh, and you can see there's my account. This is my, my dev account and some of the content that I've been producing. Uh, then we also have uh, groups, which are sort of clusters of content. Uh, and then we have, um, uh, we've, each group can be a community that's self-organizing. So Here's a group with just me and Alex in it, but we also have other groups. And the content here is really rich. So here's the front page for the group. And uh, it allows us to really deeply express ourselves with a hierarchy of content. Uh, and you can also embed content inside of uh, other documents. Uh, so we're trying to build a really rich system for, for deep collaboration. And uh, before we get too distracted by what we see on the screen, I think we should maybe start walking through uh, through this system on a sort of step-by-step -step, uh, level. And we can uh, understand a lot of the complexity that, that lives here. But uh, the, the important things to know is that all of the content you see here is peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. This is a local-first desktop application. Uh, and uh, all the content is uh, authenticated, signed by all of the authors, and it's versioned. Uh, and it's 
permanently saved, of course, with IPFS. Right. So this, uh, let's unpack some of that. So it's local first. That means that you can switch off your Wi-Fi and you can be on a plane and you can be authoring documents. And because all of this is collaborative, a big part of the magic here is that you can then reconcile your changes with the changes of, say, Alex, who was working on, say, one of these documents um, that was part of a group. Yep. And this happens um, sort of in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So it's using lib P2P and IPFS under the hood to both manage the connections to other peers. And so, so right now, are you, are you, which peers are you connected to? Sure, yeah, you can see down here, uh, I've got this little uh, network, network connectivity tab. It shows these are the uh, uh, Minter peers that we're connected with, 127 peers that we know about on this machine, uh, six people that I'm connected to right now. Uh, and actually, you can see that this person is duplicated because they have two devices. This is Gabo, our co-founder, or the founder of Minter, really. And uh, these are the sites that we're connected to. So we're also br building bridges to the web. So we have a handful of sites uh, already out there. A lot of people are experimenting with, uh, with Minter, and these are the servers that are, are up and that I'm connected to right now. I see. So what's the difference between an account and a peer? Uh, in a, an account, well, actually, this is really leads well into our next question with regards to identity. Um, so uh, maybe Bertie can explain a little bit about how our identity system works, uh, starting with you know, how peers are going to identify themselves with, these, uh, with the 12 words, basically. Yeah, so the identity starts with, um, with the crypto seed that we generate randomly when you create your account for the first time. And it's a BIP39 um, mnemonic words that you might be familiar with if you have a, crypto, a cryptocurrency wallet, a Bitcoin wallet, Ethereum wallet. Most uh, cryptocurrency use this uh, standard. And uh, Eric, maybe you can pull up the Miro, the drawing that uh, yep. we have. Okay, so BIP39, that's the stand that was set. It's a Bitcoin improvement protocol, but it's actually been broadly adopted in, in this, uh, both in the crypto space, but just even broadly in Web3. And that is just really a way to, using 12 words to basically derive your private key, and not just one private key, if I understand it correctly, um, you can really, using those 12 words, you can derive as many private keys as you want. You can, you can have these HD derivation paths. Is, is that a good way to, to put it? Right, but we don't use quite, um, we don't use that particular, we don't use hierarchical derivation because each device has okay. a separate random key. So, but your identity starts with a seed, uh, but in reality, any key that can, that is able to sign any uh, content, it can be a Minter account key. But the, the main point of this identity system was that we don't want to share any keys across different devices. So we are we are we were thinking about multi-device usage from the from from the beginning, and um, yeah, the status quo right now in most systems is that you just share a key, and if the device gets compromised, well, uh, you you're out of luck, uh, unless you have a password or you know, something like that. We don't want to. We didn't want to run into those risks, so we uh, we 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 came up with this. Um, with this idea that you have your account key, which we don't store permanently, but with that, but that account ID is what identifies you as a as a user on the system, and um, and then you generate different device keys. Each device has its own totally random key, not tied to to your original seed or anything, um, and then account key signs the special key delegation object, which is then uh, which devices then use as a proof that they belong to that account. So there's a verifiable proof between device key and account key, but all the content is signed with the device key. So then there, there is no, if the device gets compromised, we currently don't have it, but we've, uh, we, like it, it, it was um, thought that you can revoke uh, device keys as well. So you can sign a revocation, uh, object which is then can be used to, for others to know that this device was uh, revoked. I see. So where does the account private key live? 
I guess so, it, it's only living on one device, right? Well, actually, it's not. Well, it doesn't live anywhere. By the way, okay. basically, you you have those words. They the seed encodes the the seed is encoded in twelve words, and then a special key for mentor, a dedicated key. We use another specification uh, named slip ten, from which we for which we so we derive a special key only for minter. So you can use the same seed that you use for a Bitcoin, for example. You can derive a different key, which will be unrelated. Um, and we will use that key to sign the key delegation. And then you will use the device key to sign the content. So we, only, we don't store the account private key um, anywhere, only in memory when we sign the key delegation. And then it gets... I see, I see. So basically it's like, so every time you add a new device, you need the account private key in order to sign a new device key. And it's yes. sort of ephemerally, you, you just enter the 12 words. Basically, so basically when I ask where it lives, is it lives on a piece of paper maybe, or right. yeah. encrypted in your password manager. And you just use it sort of temporarily just to create a new, sign a new device, private key, and you basically right. I think there's it. another drawing up there, uh, Eric, if you can move a bit up, I think it's describes better um more higher level uh the idea yeah so okay. there is a no the other one <laughs> that one yeah there's a seed uh there's a derivation happening from which we derive we derive from the seed the account key and then we delegate uh with the key delegation to a separate device key pairs the right, right. to represent our account on the net on the network and by Just the way, out of device, curiosity, what does SLIP stand for? I, I actually, it's Satoshi Labs, um, there's a company. Okay. Mm -hmm. Satoshi Labs is a lot behind the Lightning Network uh, tech, right? Yes, and well, Bitcoin in general and everything related. Yeah. So they, they have, there are BIPs and Satoshi Labs developed a bunch of other specs, which they call SLIPs, and um, they are basically second level specs for Bitcoin related. Um, ecosystem and well device device key pairs are what we used for lip to p as well so your uh, peer id is the device your device's public key okay and this is like an ed25519 um yeah right this is the one we use <clears throat> Okay, so that's your identity and essentially every device. So when, you, when we think of an account, you essentially have really multiple devices and they each have a unique key, so you're not sharing keys. And that way you get sort of the benefit of uh, preventing it falling into the wrong hands. Or if you lose a device, you can still sort of uh, author content and, and distinguish really between where the change is coming from. That's also, I guess, useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, in the, in the app, you can see that as well. Like that's the difference between uh, the list of peers that we have here, where, you know, as, as we said, there's, you know, can be duplicated accounts uh, compared to actually listing the accounts over here. These are all the people basically in the system. By the way, I'm two color. That was the one, uh, I don't know if you were wondering, but uh, oh, I saw that see. I was one of your peers because I, I actually, here, there we go. I see it there on the screen. Above oh, yeah. green bond man. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. So, you so can I can actually trust, trust you. And if I yeah. trust you, then what that means is that your content will sort of be prioritized uh, on my app. And uh, it means that, uh, so here when I'm listing all the trusted publications, now I'm going to be able to see your content here amongst everyone else's. Very cool. Cool. Should we? talk about uh, how data is uh, made permanent in the system, uh, of course, with, with IPFS, which, you know, uh, for this audience, everyone knows that, you know, as long as anyone is av available to, you know, pin or seed the content, then it's available to everybody. And because everything is content addressable, you don't actually have to trust who you're getting the content from. Uh, and because now we understand everything is signed, uh, you can truly trust that uh, it is the content you're looking for, even if it's content that you've never seen before. Right. Yeah. So you, you mentioned, I, I think we, we sort of uh, skimmed over that, but um, you mentioned that all content that you create is signed with your device key. That's a critical thing, right? So that you can reconcile changes and whatnot. You can know where they're coming from. Um, 
and uh, and then we spoke about connections and peers. Uh, so each of the device keys is essentially a lib P2P. So any lib P2P, and by that um, also an IPFS node in the network is just really a key pair. Uh, so those key pairs are essentially the device keys that you derive. And um, I'm just, one of the things I'm curious is how did your device discover, how did your instance of Minter di discover my uh, identity? Was this just because I was looking maybe at one of the documents that I opened um, that was authored by you? Well, yeah, r right now our syncing um, policy is pretty aggressive. So we basically sync all the content from all the peers that, uh, from all the minted peers that you have connected with. So you probably have connected to someone, uh, maybe to a site, uh, which Eric also happened to be connected with, and then everything was synced uh, between you and Eric. And How are you yeah. able to tell apart lead P2P peers from minter peers? Because yeah. essentially all minter peers are lead P2P peers, but not all lead P2P peers are minter peers. Right. I'm yeah. not sure if I got that. Yeah. The, the connection tab that, was, that Eric shown you only shows minter peers, but behind the scenes, there are probably hundreds of other um, IPFS only or lib P2P pure lib peers like DHD nodes and whatnot and just common uh, IPFS nodes, but they are not shown here. Oh, basically, we didn't uh, have time yet to implement that. And we tell apart a Minter peers from others, but because we have a special, well, a custom uh, network protocol. So we, okay. when we establish the connection, we then there is this identify the uh, P2P protocol that exists, which, um, Peers exchange information about which protocols they support, and then we take a look at that list. And if it supports a Minter protocol, then we consider it a Minter peer. And then there is a, an additional handshake on top of that that peers use to exchange um, to exchange their information. So you you t you're talking to the device, but you really want to know what account it belongs to. So then this handshake uh, in during this handshake peers exchange uh, their key delegation objects. And they say, hey, I belong to that account, and here's the proof for that. And then we can, we can start uh, talking the Minter protocol with them. I see. OK, yep. so we've covered authentication and identity, essentially. Then we talked about direct connections. Um, we sort of, do we want to go more into permanent data, like which is kind of like our third topic and or did we essentially cover that by saying that all content is essentially content addressable so every change in every document everything has a SID yeah pretty much every yeah every, everything is content addressable and permanent with IPFS but the way we actually um, model all of this data is um, needs a bit more explanation but it's it's going to be later on that we talk about it Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we might as we might as well get into that now because uh, we have this concept called entities, and entities are uh, mutable uh, things in the system, basically. And and the three types of entities that we have so far are account profiles. So, for example, I can change my alias and my bio and my pro, uh, profile photo, my avatar, uh, documents, which uh, of course you've seen is like kind of the heart of the of the product. And, uh, and groups, which is a little bit more uh, interesting. We'll talk about groups later, but maybe we should talk about how entities actually work under the hood because they're actually modeled, every entity is modeled as a series of changes and we can actually see all of the changes that have been made. This is not a very complex document, but if we go into history of hypertext, we can see there's 30 versions uh, and we can see all the different uh, changes that have been uh, made on it. So maybe Alex can go into some details about how uh, these changes are interpreted to uh, understand the latest state of an entity. Hmm. So yeah, the the entity is basically a, a mutable thing, a mutable object, JSON-like kind of object. So it's a structural um, structural document, and um, it is um, mutable over time. So we want to track changes over time uh, to that entity, and. Um, 
the state of the entity is basically the set of changes that happened to the entity. And changes are uh, the IPFS uh, blocks. Um, we actually calling them blobs because we also have blocks inside documents. Uh, so to distinguish the concepts, we're we're getting used to calling them blobs. And um, so IPFS um, blobs um, are actually changes, immutable changes signed by devices um, belonging to accounts, and uh, they express the mutation that is happening to the entity. And those mutations are what describe the what define the CRDT. Uh, the, the CRDT mechanics for this, for these changes to be merged, and we've we've been doing a very, it's kind of a naive and um, pretty simplistic CRDT comparing to um, to um, many existing projects, because most of the conflict resolution strategy boils down to last rider wins. So we just merge the state. Uh, for multiple changes, we compare the timestamps for those changes, and we also compare, we sort the changes by dependencies. So each change, pretty much like in Git, uh, it depends on other changes, uh, but uh, and it can be it can be depending on more than one change. So the changes form a DAG, and then um, to get the current state of the entity, you just walk the DAG, you apply the change, and you get to the state of the entity. And uh, this is can we pause there, Alex? Yeah. So first of all, uh, I mean, I think most of the people who are watching this will probably be familiar with the CRDT, but I think it may be worth just to briefly introduce in case folks aren't familiar. So CRDT stands for Conflict Flea Resolution Data Type. And right. yeah. What, basically, how would you most succinctly describe it? Yeah. Yeah, so CRDT basically is a way to model your data so that you can make changes without having conflicts. And so anyone can make a change to, to a piece of information. And then whenever all those changes um, are shared across peers, as long as all the peers have all the same changes, the final state that they will see will be the same. So you deterministically um, can apply those changes and uh, resolve conflicts in a deterministic way. So yeah, conflict-free replicated data types. So it's meant for replicating data without having conflicts. Um, and well, this conflict-free thing um, actually sometimes might be, um, so it, you might not have a conflict, but you may end up with some um, crappy data. So you still have to be careful with, uh, it's not all magic, <laughs> you, you have to be careful with how do you apply those changes and whether or not you need to detect some deterioration while you be, while you're being applying those changes and, and uh, the classic i think example that is usually given for sure crdts are fantastic and they will every every basically uh user in the system will deterministically assuming that they have all the same change log they will always result at the same end result mm -hmm. but the classic sort of example of that end result not, might not be what you want is when you're talking about collaborative text editing where you have two folks who are editing at the same time and then when you reconcile the changes you have a lot of like weird interpolation of the text right yeah um, that's right and because we we don't actually our CRDT doesn't do um, like character level granularity we uh, our documents are um, built with hierarchical blocks, pretty much similar to Notion, uh, but actually the idea comes from way back um, in computer science history. Um, and um, so we do the conflict resolution on the block level right now. So, okay. and, uh, this, so this, one block or the other will win. It's not like you're trying to do this on the character level. Um, right. And, and can you tell me something? So you mentioned that you do basically the last writer wins. And in order to figure out the last writer, you use a combination of a timestamp. And in addition to that, the dependency. And by dependency, you mean basically who was the last change? It's something kind of like, it sounds something like a LAMP or like a vector clock. Am, am I thinking right. about this the right way? Yeah, so the timestamp that uh, actually we, we do use a, um, a timestamp for the conflict resolution, but we use the dependency to sort the changes. So we, um, because changes okay. form 
like many other systems and also lots of other CRDT uh, projects, and most of them are built around the idea of a log of changes. But in our case, we have a DAG of changes because um, we also wanted to support branches. So, we could, so you, for you to be able to create a branch for your document independently uh, from another branch of your document. So those are two different branches that later can merge back together. So um, it's, it's not a log of changes, it's a DAG of changes, but we sort uh, this DAG by walking topologically the links between the dependent I and see. then when we apply the change to the state, we, we check the timestamp for, um, for deciding who's the last writer. So the timestamp that we use um, is, it, the, well, it's similar to Lamport timestamp, and you, you, you said it right. So the Lamport, the, the key idea behind the Lamport timestamp is that you, the happened, it's normally called happened before um, relationship. So anything that is newer than something that you have already seen will have a greater timestamp. And uh, our timestamp also follows the same rule, but we actually embed also in there the physical timestamp. So this, this is from a paper called uh, Hybrid Logical uh, Clock, uh, Hybrid Logical Timestamps. Well, I actually don't remember the But if you Google Hyper Logical, uh, Hybrid Logical <laughs> Clock, yep. you will see the a paper that describes the idea how you can combine physical time with uh, logical time, um, and it it can be used for deciding approximately the like to the to nano to microsecond precision. You can find your uh, physical time, and you can also you it also follows these guarantees that anything that was before that you have seen will have a lower timestamp than something that you're about to create. I so see. It, so the term was hybrid logical clock, and um, yeah. and uh, yeah. I'll, I'll probably we can link to that in the show notes. Right. Okay. So yeah, the 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 timestamp. Um, if you naively apply the wall timestamp, you, you can get all to all sorts of pro troubles with uh, clock skews, and uh, sometimes your time can go back in time and stuff like that. Um, so we have both things. The, the dependencies will also convey the causality of things, and we have a timestamp with these rules that will be more precise anyway. So anything that is inside of your dependency, tr transitive closure of dependencies, so anything that you have seen before that you are basing on right now will have a lower timestamp. And all of this is essentially necessary so that you can enable collaboration while also being local first. So you can be offline, you can, we can collaborate on a document and then we can later reconcile it. Something that is not possible to do with Notion. Right, yeah. No, actually, um, our system is mostly about public data right now, so we don't focus on privacy yeah, yeah. or like your, for personal information. So anything that you write in Mentor is supposed to be published at some point or made public at some point. So that's the main difference between Notion and Minter, I would say. And yeah, that's okay. right. In Notion, you cannot go offline and just edit the document um, because they need the server to uh, decide which order the changes need to be applied to. OK, so basically, we essentially covered here how entities are your concept of mutability and entities can be account profiles or entities, documents or entities, groups or entities and entities are essentially, you, you implement mutability by uh, using a CRDT and mm -hmm. essentially each change in that CRDT is obviously mutable. Um, it's, each change is signed, we've covered that I think uh, earlier. And mm -hmm. yep. it also has um, what you call a hybrid logical clock in order to be able to order or at least figure out the causality. Mm -hmm. And because you can have um, forks, I, I forgot what was the term that you use where we can basically, I can fork your document and then work on it independently and I don't even have to reconcile it. But that's where you sort of essentially form a DAG that allows you to I forgot what the DAG was for and how that relates to the CRDT. Yeah, the, yeah. the DAG is for changes. So each okay. the changes form a DAG because okay, you just, can depend on yeah, the yeah, okay. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, branching can naturally happen under a few different circumstances, right? Like if you start editing my document, but I don't necessarily start adopting your changes, then you're effectively working in your own space. But also if two people who are collaborating, uh, you know, one person goes offline, they go on a plane and they make a bunch of changes while some other changes happen offline, that's going to create a natural fork, but that can be resolved uh, when everyone comes back online together. Okay, and the term is branch, and it's really like Git-like in a sense of how it forms a DAG. Well, in Git, branches are explicit, but in this case, they can happen uh, without you wanting them. Okay, so it's just yeah, yeah. Because of concurrent uh, editing. And by the way, yeah. we, we talked about uh, collaboration, but one thing, to, one thing worth mentioning is that we're now focusing um, mostly on asynchronous collaboration use case. So it's not that you're at, in real time uh, collaborating with your um, collaborators, but instead it's much, much more like Git where you start, you, you make an edit, you change it, then you share it with everyone else and then they merge it back. And all of this right now is happening um, implicitly. So you can edit anything and then anyone who has this, they have different perspective on this document. So if a document is published to, well, actually, we, we will get uh, to that later. You can publish a document into a site, and then you can see different perspective on this document according to that site, according to any change that I happen to have locally from any other peer, or according to only my trusted peers. So you have this uh, context switcher where you can select which perspective of it you, you want to, to look at. How about we go a little bit into the uh, uh, the document structure and the sort of things that you can do inside of a document? Um, because yeah, it's actually a very expressive uh, data structure. So I'll go ahead and go into one of my documents here. In fact, it might be more interesting if I go into someone else's document and start, start editing. So hopefully we can find a, a good one. Um, well, as we may think is a really one of our sort of legendary documents. You can see we've got a few versions of it. Uh, and inside of it, uh, the whole document is actually expressed as a hierarchy. So we can have subsections with a hierarchy inside of it, like bullet points uh, or you know numbers. Uh, and we have all sorts of different block types available to us here. Uh, for example, we can embed code. Uh, we can, uh, uh, and one of the more really interesting things, one, one of the places where a lot of depth will sort of come into the system is when you can actually take part of one document and embed it into another. So we call those mm -hmm. uh, embeds. Traditionally, they're known as transclusions in the, uh, in the you know, I think that Augment called it, D Doug Engelbart, or was this a... No, a it, was Ted, it was Ted Nelson. Ted Nelson, yeah. So with, uh, with Xanadu, came up with this concept, concept of transclusion. So here, there's part of this document that's embedded in another document. And uh, if I just uh, go to a different document, I can actually grab the whole document or part of a different document. Uh, so I'll say, for example, we're, this document we were in before, History of Hypertext, I'll copy just a reference to this uh, top block. And here, inside of this other document, we can embed content just by pasting. So I've pasted in a reference to this other document. And actually, I can copy all sorts of different things. So if I want to reference a person, uh, this is effectively a mention. Uh, I can do that. And here, we'll, we'll paste in a reference to uh, our co-founder, Horatio. I see. And does that mean that you can also embed a group? Yeah, it does. Um, so we can copy a reference to a group like the hyper.media group. And the cool thing is, um, first of all, by the way, these, these links that we're copying are, um, uh, in most cases, they're either referring to a site or they can refer to a URL that's on the gateway. And a gateway URL is literally a hyper.media domain URL. And we treat those very specially because uh, if, you, if you're just a normal person on the web, you know, you can load content through the gateway at hyper.media. Or uh, you know, if you're in the app, we actually will treat it as peer-to-peer -peer content. Uh, so we don't actually have to hit the gateway. The gateway could be offline, for example, and everything will continue to work. So it's a very resilient 
uh, system, these hyper.media links that we're copying and pasting around. Um, so hopefully I should be able to go back to our draft and paste in a reference to this group. Uh, well, in this case, it didn't resolve properly, but uh, generally, in fact, that was uh, that was the one group that actually I have not allowed to copy a reference to because it's oh, it's yeah. a combination <laughs> of a it's a combination of a site and a group. But if I go into Horatio's demo group here, I can go back, and here this should work. Oh, well, it's it's gotten a little bit confused, but basically. Well, Demo, to okay. be fair, I'm I'm the one who's gotten confused. <laughs> um, I need to to copy it as a because when I was copying this link before, I was actually copying a link to the proper domain. But if I copy the public group URL, then you can see the actual text that I've uh, pasted is uh, on hyper.media, uh, and I can. So you so won't Horatio's actually see the link. Notebook is a group. Yeah, it is. Uh, and groups are okay. the, oh, okay. the primary mechanism for organizing documents in the hypermedia system. And here I've loaded it on the web on the hyper.media domain. And so this is the actual text that I had copied. Uh, and in the app, we don't actually need this hyper.media server to be up or doing anything. The app knows how to handle these URLs natively. So this is where we have a lot of the sort of power of the system because you know, the users are going to be copying these URLs. If they want to share them to somebody who doesn't have Minter, it's going to work just fine. But if they're using it inside of the Minter app, it knows how to make these native references. OK, this is kind of like it's a bit of a, a tricky point I, that I, I think, think is worth unpacking a bit slowly. Yeah, yeah. So if I understand it correctly. Yeah, yeah, go on, Alex. I think it's worth mentioning that unlike many uh, projects that are in this peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, industry and local first and whatnot, um, it seems like a lot of people are trying to struggle or to fight with the web or to build a new web or to eat from the web. But in our case, we kind of embrace the web and we build all sorts of uh, integration points. Uh, for convenience and, well, basically just because we think the web is not going anywhere anytime soon. So we want uh, we want to have both things. Uh, for people who don't want to use the web, they don't have to, but for people who want, we try to make it super convenient for them. So you know how, the, how lots of apps, peer-to-peer uh, -peer apps and, uh, and apps built on IPFS, they would have sort of some sort of a custom URL scheme. So they would my app uh, colon slash slash. We also have that, but we we kind of hide it behind, we transform it into this hyper.media uh, web URL, which we own the domain. So uh, we know it's not going anywhere and we can, um, if you want to share, it, it's ready to be shared. So if you copy the URL, you can share it on the web, on Twitter with your with your friends. And they will go through this gateway. So we, behind this URL, we are running a, a gateway, which is similar to the idea of the IPFS gateway. But this gateway knows to talk Minter protocol and understand Minter documents. So it shows, uh, shows them nicely on the web. But if you paste that kind of a URL in the app, we will transform it back. So these URLs are never stored in the IPF data stored in IPFS. So anything that is um, that that is web related, we trying to as much as we can convert it back to the its permanent form. So um, even if you paste okay, so if it's fair to say, form, yeah, you can go back and forth transparently between a native URL, a native Minter URL, and a web URL. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So essentially, it's and those URLs are pointing to something that is mutable in the system? Either way, yes. actually. So, um, okay. there's actually so it's either a SID? Yeah, this, this is an entity ID. This uh, Technically, the full entity ID has the G in front of it because it specifies that it's a group. And then this is uh, the main ID that's part of the entity. And this ID is actually tied back to the original author of the, the group, or in this case, the, the owner of the group. Um, and then you can also have an optional version parameter that's uh, passed in here. So for example, uh, if I go into, uh, well, there's there basically like there, the uh, version parameter can, is uh, a 
what we call a version, and a version is a set of SIDs uh, that are all the current, all the changes of the version. So because a version can actually contain multiple changes, uh, it is either a SID or a set of SIDs uh, right. so to we, identify we talked, the, the exact about, version. We talked about how uh, changes form a DAG, so naturally you can end up with more than one leaf in this DAG. So you, for example, if we've been currently edited, this, we, we have a draft and we have created an edit from the same point, but we didn't know about each other's edit, but then we merged them back. So now we have two leaves in this DAG and this is a valid version. Each of, our, each of the leaves is a valid version and each combination of the leaves is also a valid version. And uh, to we basically concatenate, if you, if you link to a version that is a, that has two more than one leaf, then uh, we concatenate them into a string. So you have um, a version that has more than one seed, a, a CID. So um, yeah, the, and entity, uh, we should have uh, talked about it when we were talking about entities. Entities have, a, have an identifier, they need a, naturally need an identifier, which is not content addressable because uh, we don't want- it. It's mutable. Yeah, it's mutable. But it is uh, unlike IPNS, for example, it is not tied to a single key because um, we actually sign content with a different key and we don't want to create key for each new entity. So it's basically a, ran a combination of some random number uh, and um, information from the owner of the entity. So the one who creates the entity, it will be uh, random, a, a random, um, some random number combined with their account ID with the time where entity was produced and um, so we get this short random number which has enough collision resistance for like, for the foreseeable future and for lots of different um, entities that you might have locally on your machine so how many bits is the uh, how many bits are these identifiers it's one uh, 28 bits so it's like a uid but uh but quite okay. shorter. it's just it has a shorter representation because we use capital letters in this. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, that's like basically just the the base representation of it, the string right. representation of it. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of things there that I think are worth like unpacking, and I'll just reiterate what you've said, and it will probably be a bit more obtuse than how you summarized it, but it's both from my understanding and for uh, other uh, naive listeners like uh, myself. So. Basically, we, we describe these three entities that are mutable in the system, uh, account profiles, documents, and groups. Um, each one of these is essentially a set of changes. They form a DAG, and, it's a, and you basically, to know the current kind of state of it, you have this CRDT that basically shows you what it looks like right now. You can have multiple versions. You can have a lot of ni nice, neat stuff. In order to identify an entity, you had to come up with a way uh, to essentially do that and you instead of introducing more keys into the system you decided to go with essentially a unique ID that you generate that is derived in part from the did you say the the public key in addition to some random number in addition to maybe a timestamp or something like that yeah. that's to avoid collision resistance and you're working in 128 bit space which uh, is more than sufficient to avoid these uh, collisions and in order to essentially tie all of these uh, different immutable changes to a single entity, uh, you just point to them? Is it like just a pointer that every single immutable change is just has a pointer to that entity and that's how you're able to aggregate all of them? Yeah, that's right. That's basically what it is. Each chain mentions the entity that it mutates and we group them by that, by that entity. And before that, before we got into like what actually are entities, so now I, I get how entities are, uh, how entities work. Um, I'm very curious about how you do this interoperability with the web, because essentially uh, Minter as it is right now is a native app. I believe you're using Tori and you're using some Rust and some web stuff, but you're really, it's, it's, it's amazing that you're doing all of this while really trying to create as much of uh, an interoperable experience with the web platform. Um, and yep. so 
a big part of that is how you use URLs. Um, do you call them URLs, the native ones um, that are minter colon slash slash? We, we refer to, to, our, uh, to our sort of, our new URL format as hypermedia URLs. And there's actually two forms of hypermedia URLs. Uh, there's either uh, hyper.media HTTPS URLs, or there's okay. hm colon slash slash URLs. And that distinction is actually only there for practical purposes, because if we're opening the application from the web, for example, uh, like we actually need uh, to call into our native application with the hm right. colon slash slash protocol. Uh, so on our website, for example, you can see, oops, there we go. There's this open and Minter app. Uh, and I'm gonna, not going to click it right now because it'll open a slightly different version of the app on my computer. But um, basically, we can, can you easily just copy the URL and just show us. Yeah. Even just in the the. I don't know if I guess it's hard to see. I, I don't think it's visible. It's hard to see. But maybe you can just paste it without clicking into it inside the. Um, I'm not sure if we. I'm not sure if we fixed that. Copy link address. Let's okay. see. Uh, yeah. So as you can see, this okay. is the sort of raw form of the of the URL that uh, will be presented with the app. And you can see that it includes the version, because we want to make sure that the CID is available when we send it to the app. Uh, so that way, if it needs to access it from the peer-to-peer -peer yeah. network, it knows how to do that. Uh, yeah, so, and it, it shows you the exact same version that you're seeing, because an entity exactly. could be resolved to, to different versions by different sort of entities in the network, depending on what changes they're able to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so once the... Okay. Uh, the app is open. The app will usually be presenting web URLs because those are more practical for the user. So, but then if you use web URLs, this hyper.media HTTPS URL inside of the app, it'll basically be treating it as one of these URLs under the hood. It knows how to translate between them. Uh, and okay. I do have to quickly correct you, actually. We, we were a Tori app last year, but we, we found that we didn't have as much Rust expertise on the team as we really needed to maintain. So uh, we've actually switched to Electron, and that's what you're seeing right now is the Electron version of our app. Yeah. Maybe maybe you can speak a little bit to some of the challenges of wanting to do everything for the web platform, but being sort of constrained. What, what are some of those constraints, and um, how do you sort of reconcile those through your approach that reconciles, I mean, essentially the two platforms? Yeah, we, we need to use a handful of techniques. And what we just described, where we're automatically converting from HTTPS URLs to HM colon slash slash URLs, is that's one of the techniques. And the other technique is going to become more relevant uh, in a minute when we start talking about sites. Uh, so maybe we should just introduce what sites are, and then we can yeah. talk about how that bridging actually works. And maybe we can see some of it in action if it's if it's working well, well for us this morning. Uh, so. Uh, a site is basically what happens when you know you and your community, who is like a, a group, for example, the hyper.media. Well, again, this is kind of a weird group to use as an example because this uh, is this is also the domain for our gateway. So maybe we can find the uh, Minter group, or the yeah, so the Minter hypermedia group. This is a little bit of a be better uh, one to use, even though I'm on my dev account, so I'm not actually a member. But this is what it looks like if you're not a member of the group. You can come in, you can see the owner of the group. Here's our founder. Here's all of the people on the team. So the owner is allowed to add uh, editors. And then any of the owner or the editors are allowed to modify any of the content in the group. And here you can see we have a bunch of different references to uh, different documents uh, in the group along with their pretty path. Uh, so this is like the actual path on mentor.com where this will be available. So if I click on one of these and then open it in the web browser, it's going to open it on Minter.com. And uh, as you can see, it contains both the version. So we're referring to the exact version uh, of this thing that the group has referenced. But then also, it's available at the pretty path. So this version is optional. Uh, so now the question is, if one of these URLs is pasted into the application, you know, going back to how we're bridging between sites uh, and the app, we want to be able to dereference that and turn this back into a hyper.media or just an actual hypermedia link, a native uh, hypermedia reference. Basically, you want so, to be able to go from yeah. that to an entity ID and maybe a version. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the, the secret behind, the, behind how that works is if I go and op view the source, we have a meta tag that tells the application what the entity ID and version is of this. So hypermedia. So here's the hypermedia entity ID. 
and here's okay. the hypermedia entity version. This so is this is neat. kind of the secret sauce. No one really needs to know about this ideally if they're using the application. But if we go into like a new draft, for example. But tell me something, is minter.com, is, is that like the public gateway that everyone uses? No, actually, and we can talk more about the difference between uh, what is Minter and what is Hypermedia. So okay. just, just in the past year, we've started to sort of tease apart uh, how this is going to work, where basically Hypermedia is an open protocol. We've intentionally chose an incredibly generic name uh, because we want anybody to be able to participate in it. Um, and the Minter application is the application that our company makes, and our company will be doing other things as well. But uh, the Hypermedia app, the Minter application is just a reference implementation for the Hypermedia protocol. Okay. So here you can see it's resolving, and hopefully it'll be able to resolve. Now it's actually gone and natively embedded this entire other document, but it's it didn't really need the web to do that. Or as soon as it's resolved it uh, from the web, it's able to treat this as a native thing. So if I sort of go offline, or if I were to mm. go into debug mode and show you what the actual value of this is, it's referring to uh, or it's rather embedding the actual hypermedia reference. Uh, and the and HM you just pasted URL. the HTTPS URL from yeah, the browser. exactly. So, so I pasted, I pasted a URL that the user might not even realize is actually uh, a hypermedia thing. So we're this is one of the more powerful uh, bridges that we're building between the web because when you link to uh, something from a hypermedia document, it will try to to resolve it. Uh, it, it, you know, as a hypermedia reference by checking for these, for these meta tags. If it finds these meta tags, it's going to be able to save this as a permanent link into the system rather than an HTTPS link, which, as we all know, is very broken and bad because you know the content there could change, the content there could go away, and you know, ten years from now, this document that you're writing here inside of Minter might be broken. It might have broken links, and that's a real tragedy. So. We're, we're on a mission to sort of solve the broken links problem on the web. So wow. basically, yeah, this, a, this, this document in, is now living on your computer, uh, and you are referencing to a local copy of it. And this HTTPS URL is not stored anywhere in the permanent data. Yeah, yeah, well, no, this is, is amazing. Stored, uh, along with the other verifiable and quantitative addressable information. We used to, in fact, have on the IPFS website a link to a paper that was showing, uh, like, was researching essentially link rot on the web. And I think it said something mm. like the average lifespan of a web page is 100 days on the web. So it's like all oh. of the websites that I created back in the days, I think it was like GeoCities and like all of these, you know, like the platforms of, I don't know, the 90s, uh, late 90s. Mm. I can't find them even on the web archive. Um, so, so this is really like, you're addressing that in a very uh, novel way. I'm curious, do these friendly URLs, do they have to be unique? Like how do you work with collisions around them or is that just? Domain is, uh, the friendly URL will have a domain and um, yeah, those are unique. <laughs> uh, you are tied okay. to the web. That's and then, uh, yeah, so we trust what domain says about whether or not it's the right entity. And because it's all HTTPS, we, and we know which domain we're going to, we can trust that they will tell us the right ID. And if they don't, well, we will not use it in our... Okay, okay. Domain. Maybe we can backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit more about sites. So any group, which is yeah. a group is just a, a collection of documents. Mm -hmm. Right. And has an owner. It, is it has an owner, exactly. has a bunch of editors, and a collection of documents with treaty paths assigned to them. So, so a the, group can be published to the web, and when it's published to the web, it's tied to a domain, which means right. that that's your namespace. Essentially, you can have whatever. You don't have this name squatting problem because each group can be tied to uh, its own domain. Right. Exactly. And the group have also these... The group is an entity, they have an entity ID, and they are uh, pretty much unique. So you have this um, unique point uh, in the addressing space. So you have your unique namespace under which you can use, uh, you can do whatever you want. So you can uh, you can um, name your documents, give them pretty, whatever pretty paths you want. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that means that entity IDs have to be unique globally across the whole hypermedia protocol. 
but T the URLs, like the friendly URLs, just have to be unique per group because it's just scoped to the main. Yeah, that's right. And technically, the entity IDs just need to be unique across your computer. Uh, if you don't, if you and it's in, it's pretty much infeasible for someone to generate. Uh, a collision because they are tied to the account, so they are they are okay. tied yeah, to yeah. the timestamp, and all of this information is cross-referenced with the first change that introduces the entity. So it's pretty uh, unlikely to have a collision in the entity ID. Yeah. So the idea of my group could only have been generated by me, uh, and that's one of the sort of cryptographic features of entity IDs. Right. So. Where do you pick your uh, friendly URL? Sorry, uh, this I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we we've tried to make it as easy as possible for people to self-host a site because we know that's super important to our community is like the self-sovereign aspect. You know, eventually our company is going to be offering services for hosting hosting a site, uh, and that's that's actually really powerful because due to the nature of the system, you don't actually need to trust us at all because as long as you point your domain which you own to our servers, uh, and as long as you have a local copy of all of your data, everything is signed and everything is backed up. So you know, even if something bad happens to us as a company and your server temporarily goes down, you can easily just move your domain to somebody else and you actually don't have to trust us at all as the, you know, ser as the server provider for your site, which is vastly different from a system like WordPress, right? So right. Um, Anyways, basically, in order to set your site up uh, for the self-hosting workflow, uh, all you need is a fresh Linux server, you know, a VPS, and you run a one-line command that uh, basically says, hey, install Minter, auto-update it, use this version, and it's the Minter web server, basically, and you specify the domain at that time. And that script runs, it sets up Docker, it sets up all of the dependencies on your server, it's very fast and simple. Uh, like people are shocked at how easy it is to self-host. And what it outputs actually is it outputs a secret setup URL that you're able to paste inside of your app. And that secret setup URL includes uh, the domain and it includes a, a secret, <laughs> as it might kind of imply. And then here inside of a group, my group already has a domain, so this isn't the best example, but the button is still here. Uh, there's a publish group to site workflow. And what you do is you just after you've run that uh, setup script, uh, you paste in the secret setup URL right here, and you click Create Site. And then your local app sort of does the handshake with the site. It says, hey, this is your group ID. Uh, you're going to lock, lock down the site. So basically, it's like going to be this group ID for, for now. And uh, it uploads all of this content to the site. Uh, and then it's all available in kind of a you know, normal, native, web-friendly way. And then it modifies the entity itself to have a reference to the website as well. So if somebody else stumbles across your group through the peer-to-peer -peer network, they can see like, oh, this is the actual web home for the for this group. Let's talk a little bit about that server. So it's a Docker container that is essentially running a, like a, a, a UI-less version of Minter. Well, it's yeah. not entirely UI-less because it does have uh, you know, all of the front end that you see here, which is like a Next.js uh, React web app. And here you can see it has a lot of the same depth and complexity. For example, you can navigate through the different versions. Uh, you know, here it's, oh, here, let me expand the list of versions. So here you can navigate through all the different versions of the content. Uh, and we have all the sort of information, all the metadata is available to you. And we can also see different uh, pieces of content that you have embedded inside of your document. And we have, uh, of course, the authorship as well. Yeah, sorry, I, I probably misphrased that, but mm -hmm. it's essentially like another device. Right. It has its own key. It's, or... another, it's more or less like another account. So it's a, but okay. it doesn't really need to have an account. So it is a peer, uh, but it's more like um, it's read only front end for like web, web UI. And uh, uh, restricted uh, backend, so it's using the same backend as our desktop app is using, but it's uh, well, it's not actually the same. It's using uh, built on top of the same uh, primitives, but is restricted yeah. to rights that writes only from the owner and the editors. Okay, 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 okay. So it's essentially another lib P two P peer. 
yeah. because of that, it has to have some key and it's an account, but that's not really the main point. The main point is that it's an HTTP server that can serve mm. all of this, um, essentially a Next.js app um, and provide all of this functionality while also um, being always sort of running because it's on a server, which means that uh, it's essentially answering all of the HTTP requests to that domain. Mm -hmm. Does it also do like the TLS, like do you do TLS? It does all that automatically, yeah. Okay, so it's using something like, uh, what is it Caddy. called? Um, okay, you, all right. Yeah. Caddy okay, so is Caddy a, does the negotiation with um, encrypt, yeah. the- um, Exactly. With Let's Encrypt. I see. Yeah, I've, I've been using Caddy recently, and it was really neat uh, just how quickly it does it. And, and so, okay, very nice, very nice. And 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 basically, so so the main the key idea here is that essentially a group can be published to a site. You can use. You might offer those services yourself, or you can self-host it. Um, yep. And of course, and of course, the site is going to be pinning all of the content available. So like. You know, if you're collaborating with people who are on the opposite side of the world and your computers are online at different times, you don't want to miss content that each other are making. So having a site is really helpful for that because the site will be storing the content for you in the meantime. A bit like um, in Scuttlebutt, there were pubs, if you remember, where it was like, yeah. Yeah. like a sync server. Yeah, similar to that. Okay, I think we covered quite a lot of space and we're at one hour and three minutes. Um, I have a number more questions, uh, but maybe we can start. First of all, is there anything else you want to share before I jump into the questions? Something that we no. I mean, from the, from the technical intro, we've really gone gone the full gamut. Uh, so, so I think people are going to be very uh, inundated with uh, with our information here. So thank you. That was really thorough, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. And. I want to know, you know, like what, what inspired creating Minter, especially, I mean, now I can also tell how distinct it is uh, in comparison to some of the other things that exist out there, but it seems like the market is saturated with these collaboration and publishing tools. Um, so, so what kind of motivated you to, despite all of that, create something new? Well, most of the, most of the inspiration was coming from the very early uh, ideas of what the hypertext system and hypermedia actually is. And well, the, the person who coined the term uh, hypertext is Ted Nelson, um, with his um, lifetime long project Xanadu that was never completed. But the ideas from it uh, will actually inspired a lot of things um, that we currently see as well, like Notion and stuff like that. But basically, we haven't seen a system that combines all these properties that we wanted to that we wanted to achieve. We want to. Uh, offer peer-to-peer, peer-to-peer, self-sovereign, local first, but at the same time being able to publish to the web, being able to link content uh, in a very rich way, being able to link to a version or link without a version. Um, so yeah, we I think we haven't found a system that does all that. And well, the idea of hierarchy and hierarchical documents is coming from Doug from the work of Doug Engelbart and his projects like uh, Augment and NLS, which, uh, which actually this is the part where Ted Nelson and Doug Engelbert, although being friends, were disagreeing a lot. So Doug Engelbert was uh, advocating for hierarchy and Ted Nelson was more about flat uh, text. Um, so we kind of trying, we're trying to bring inspiration from both, um, from both of these people yeah we're trying to bring these systems back to life but in a way that is friendly for the web because we know that we're not going to be able to really follow through with this unless we can work really seamlessly with all the content that's already out there so we have a long way to go but i think we've we're really on the right track and on that note what what, what is next for minta sort of at what state would you consider it to be at this point and how do you sort of see it evolving in the near term and also in the long term? It's a great question. We're, we're really focused right now on quality, on making sure that this is something that normal people can use uh, and we're trying to make it as fast and uh, sort of elegant as possible to, to make it so that it's not really like this arcane system that is difficult to use. We're trying to make it really uh, accessible. Um, so yeah, it's a, 
it's kind of a, in this very competitive world, we know that we need to build something that's really elegant for people uh, if they're going to adopt it. But we, we do have a lot of uh, pretty big ambitions as well. Uh, we, <laughs> well, for example, uh, Alex, do you want to mention this one project that we're going to be working on in the next couple of months that I think is going to take this whole system to the next level? Messages, you mean? Yeah, we're trying to add commentary uh, to the to this system at every level, so that way people can interact with lighter weight messages than having to create documents. Yeah, so that will be helpful for collaborating, for uh, attaching like a note to a piece of text or to a profile. And maybe eventually could be built into something more like totally different. But basically, the idea is that you can create a small message that is. Um, attached to something else okay so you kind of like use i see uh message and comment synonymously here we haven't really yeah, did, uh, yeah. landed on the exact okay uh, terminology because okay. i guess message right. implies real time and not everything in, in a lot of the workflows in mint are async so it's like maybe not the right term but anyways yeah uh, naming right things is hard enough so I'll, I'll let you figure that out um yeah, so yeah, the polishing is what we are basically right now. And fixing bugs, you, you have landed on a bunch of them. Eventually, we plan to sell infrastructure. And um, so for people to uh, to spin up managed solutions for, for hosting sites, so for those who don't want to self-host. And by the way, worth mentioning that uh, everything most, well, right, pretty much everything is open source. It's on GitHub, so uh, we also... Yes. Some people have started already to coming in and um, proposing ideas and features. So we still have a long way to figure out how to work with the community, but we're very open to to accept um, contributions. Yeah, um, we can't wait to be working with with more people from the community, either on the this Minter app yourself itself, as as you've seen it, or if other people want to build applications for the Hypermedia protocol. Yeah, and, and you, we already sort of covered the differences between the protocol and the Minter app, kind of like Minter app being the canonical implementation, but you want there to be more implementations. Um, I guess the question is, uh, how do you, so, so I had another question, I, I sort of lost my, my train of thought there, but uh, how do you plan on monetizing your work, especially seeing as Minter is open source? Yep. Uh, for one, I mean, there's what we've already talked a little bit about where we plan on selling infrastructure. So if people want to self-host content on the web, there is a lot of infrastructure that you need if we're going to run this sort of thing um, gracefully. The other thing that we hadn't actually talked about a whole lot is um, is the fact that we've, we're building in a whole micropayments system into this system. So if somebody wants to contribute financially to their favorite authors or to their community, they can actually send money directly to the authors using the Bitcoin Lightning Network and uh, using our Lightning server. So our Lightning server takes a very small transaction fee. Uh, and as a result, it actually gives you more functionality than most Lightning servers do because you can actually send one uh, Lightning payment and decide how it's going to be allocated amongst all the different authors. Uh, so you just send one sum of money and it can go get sent to all the different authors for the content that's being created. And because there's cryptographic proofs for everything, you know it's going exactly to the people who have created the content or exactly who the user wants to contribute to. I see. So you're kind of like a, uh, a routing point for Lightning, for Bitcoin Lightning payments. And mm -hmm. uh, by providing that service, because you already have ties to a lot of the publishers, then essentially you just need one channel, one new channel opened directly to your, uh, what do you call it, a node, a router? I, I forgot the term for... Well, we are it's a running, lightning server? Yeah, it's a, a lightning running server. L, L &D hub uh, node, okay. which, is, which is kind of, uh, from a single l &D instance, it creates a multi-tenant system with, uh, with a bunch of accounts tied to that same wallet. Um, but you can use any wallet and we and still route payment through the node. So uh, there are a bunch of ways. To, there's still a long way to go there as well. We are keen. We're, we're like looking forward uh, to getting into the depth of it. But um, yeah, from time to time. We're still You're talking stuck. specifically about sort of the lightning uh, network yeah. and, and some of the All innovations of that are still. 
yeah so there's a there's a bunch of ideas that another um and colleague of ours um, has in, in his mind he was he was you know, he came in, in, to mentor basically to work on the micro payments uh, things but then we got distracted with networking ipfs lib p2p dht whatnot um, yeah. And maybe that's a good moment to share what were some of the technical challenges that you encountered along the way and, and sort of how you resolve oh. them. I mean, like doing peer-to-peer -peer apps is, is just difficult, inherently difficult, and you've taken quite a serious undertaking here. Yeah, we, we've, well, in these four years, we well, almost four years, we've been, um, it was a mixed relationship with everything uh, around IPFS. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I personally, uh, well, we are we are using Go libraries that from the from the main from the Kubo to IPFS, but we don't use Kubo. We use uh, the underlying libraries, which are now finally, uh, thank God, unified Boxo. That is into Boxo. I'm very happy about it because I was struggling with these uh, micro repos that that we, that we used to have, and. Um, well, ultimately, well, actually, recently we've been finding issues with uh, with uh, infrastructure part of this, I guess, with relays, with hole punching, with DHT. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, it's really confusing whether it's you or whether it's uh, the infrastructure. Uh, we've been trying to run our own relay nodes and DHT nodes and... Um, and yeah, it was a mixed experience. There's a lot of way. There's a lot of room for improvement there. And also, I'm, I've, I've been following the improvements, so I'm pretty happy with the Boxo unification. Pretty happy with about lib P2P unification um, of the code. And uh, I've seen um, the efforts to improve the DHT, so all the new the refactors um, around the DHT library that are being done right now, which were actually promised for October. Well, we are in November, <laughs> and they looks like they're not landed yet. Uh, so yeah, we are looking forward to seeing the improvements in those libraries and infrastructure and stuff. So yeah, but, well, overall, I think we are. Uh, well, I'm personally pretty happy with with the choice of IPFS for the foundation of this. Because in the end, you cannot go, if you really want, if you just, even if you just want immutable data and content addressability, just using CIDs and IPLD, and even without using IPLD, just using CIDs for your, um, for identifying the, the blobs that you want to store already uh, makes you somewhat compatible with other possibilities with interrupt with other IPFS systems. Um, yeah, are you actually using IPLD for some of this? So, for example, a lot of the changes uh, of the CRDT, do you serialize them with like DAG CBOR or something? Yeah, the, actually, that was uh, also have a mixed relationship with IPLD. Sometimes I wish it didn't exist, <laughs> but we we are using it for uh, because not everything can be not everything in real life fits into IPLD, and not everything can be expressed as a as a as a SID. And not everything can be linked to as a SID, so it's um, sometimes it gets tricky. So we are using IPLD. We are using that for for everything that we store. I, I, I believe, and yeah, pretty much everything we store is DAX Um uh, and it changes so that the, the but not everything we link to are SID links. So sometimes yeah. we yeah. use these our, our own hyperlink system, and we index them locally, and then we can take advantage of this local index for. Um, for basically building the app, um, but the changes and the links for dependencies with these changes are IPLD and IPLD links, and pretty much every time we we just use we just want to use a SID, we use an IPLD link. But sometimes we want to use a group of SIDs in addition to something else, in addition to something else, and we we came up with this. Well, we basically use URLs with okay uh, some fancy query parameters and stuff like that. And these, these are uh, like a HTTPS URL or the HM URL? HM, HM, yeah. Okay, well, okay. Yeah, yeah. As much as we can, we try to convert uh, the web addressing space to the peer-to-peer -peer addressing space, be it Minter yeah. or be it uh, IPFS or whatever. For the identity system, did you ever consider 
using uh, any of the did specs or RFCs, uh, yes. I should say. We've considered, but we started with this before actually the did specification was um, ratified. Yeah. And I also have feelings about it because it's so complex. Most of the projects that use this don't actually use the, the major part of it. They just use the string representation of it. And uh, all the different DID methods, they kind of need a special code anyway. So it, there, there, there's a way to convert. We can just represent it as we can add did colon key colon in our account ID. And call it a day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But we just don't, and we use the, we store it in binary because it uses less space. Um, so, yeah. It, um, I hope there's, um, well, we, we, if we need to interoperate with the specification, we, will, we shouldn't have much problems with doing it in the user space, let's say, in the user facing interface layer. Wow, this has been really uh, insightful and, and I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm sure a lot of the viewers will be grateful for your time, taking this time to, to join this uh, recording. And um, I guess one final question I have is where can people find you? Do you where do you hang out online? Um, are there any upcoming events you're planning to go to? You seem to be a team that's uh, somehow managing to both deliver but also show up at events. I believe you're at BTC Prague, you're at IPFS Camp. Um, yeah. So what's a, what's a good place online, and are there any upcoming events that you'll be at? The, we use the, in, the code is at GitHub. We get, if you are a technical person, the best way, I, I think, to reach out is using GitHub. It's github.com slash minter hypermedia. Um, yep. This you can is also, and a, good, a good entry point, a good entry point is minter.com, uh, minter with two Ts. And then from there, you might want to find us on GitHub. You might want to find us on Twitter. Uh, but we hang out in Discord all the time. So if you jump into our Discord, that's the, the best way to, uh, to get in touch with us on a, uh, on a faster basis. Uh, we don't have any uh, technical themed events coming up, but we are going to uh, the Open Core Summit in San Francisco in December. And beyond that, uh, we're, we're open for, for more events because we're really excited to sort of reach out to the, to the community uh, and get the word out. I see. So to find you in Discord, there's the link on minter.com. Um, you can see the URL at the bottom here. This has been really great. Eric and Alex, I, I greatly appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much for having us. us. All right.